Welcome to the Art of Feminine Negotiation, from the boardroom to the bedroom. The podcast that helps you negotiate your best life and stop missing out because, let's face it, all of life is a negotiation. If you're looking to live your life on purpose and with purpose and to get what you want and deserve from the boardroom to the bedroom, you've come to the right place. We've got you covered. This is where expert and novice negotiators alike come to up-level their game and get more out of life. With your host, award-winning author, attorney, international speaker, and master negotiator, Cindy Watson. Welcome to another episode of The Art of Feminine Negotiation. I'm your host, Cindy Watson, and I'm really excited to introduce you to Tracy Lewis today. Welcome, Tracy. It is so great to have you here. Thank you. It's such an honor, Miss Cindy. Thank you. And we are today going to be talking, the title of this podcast is Never Let Them See You Coming or How to Negotiate Like a Narcissist and Create Winning Solutions that Foster Ongoing Partnerships. And I'm sure a lot of you who know my program are going to be really interested to see how this plays out because I'm all about the art of feminine negotiation and rapport building and empathy. So the narcissism and never let them see you coming jumped at me, but then it's creating winning solutions that foster ongoing partnerships. So I'm guessing we're on the same page, but either way, it will definitely be interesting. So Tracy Lewis comes to us as a realtor with more than 20 years of experience. She has one of the largest rev share teams at eXp Realty with over 3,600 agents in her organization. And previously, she was recruiter of the year globally for Keller Williams, and Tracy owned her own huge Century 21 franchise. She also led the number one Century 21 team in the nation for eight years. Pretty impressive. Also, as if that isn't enough, she's written several books, including the critically acclaimed Defy the Odds, and she's developed training courses as well and been featured exclusively on TV, radio, and podcasts all over the U.S. and beyond, including, I'm sure you'll have heard, Flip This House, Sally Jesse Raphael, and the Success Radio Network. And on a sort of fun fact about Tracy, she's consistently voted the most fun golfer and says that's probably because she's most likely to be on the giving end of any side bet. So maybe I'll have to try golfing with her because God knows I'm not a good golfer. But when Tracy... (laughs) Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Sound good. And when Tracy's not helping realtors get financially free and work less by changing their approach, you can find her on the beach, as you can see behind her with that gorgeous backdrop that I am so jealous of, or traveling to her favorite city, which as Tracy likes to say, is whatever city she hasn't been to yet. So Tracy, really excited to hear your sort of take, especially as a woman in real estate and you know, with a wealth of negotiating experience yourself. But I thought we'd start off. I know that you talk a bit in your materials about how to prime people even before you say hello. And I'd love to hear your take on that. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And it's such a huge honor to, to be talking with you mm. today. So we're all being primed in ways that we are completely blind to. So one of my favorite stories is the Yale study that was done where a group of researchers out and ask total strangers, excuse me, could you please hold my coffee? So, you know, for example, Cindy, I hand you my coffee. I do something on my phone. I thank you. I take the coffee back. I go on my merry way. And then another researcher is sent a few minutes later and says to this person that had previously held the coffee for the other stranger for $20, would you mind reading this story and telling me how you feel about the the main character? So they read a three or four character story, gave their impression. Now, the people that had previously held warm coffee for a total stranger found the characters to be warm and inviting. However, people that had held a cold cup of coffee found the character to be cold and uh, disinterested. So So, interesting. Yeah, it, it really is absolutely fascinating. So whenever you're negotiating, you need to really understand that it's not just about the words that you say. There are ways to prime people that you're negotiating with before you even meet them. We, we all understand the law of reciprocity, the giving of gifts to people. So that's why whenever you go into a car dealership, if they offer you a cup of warm coffee and you take that cup of coffee, you're more likely to agree to the undercoat carriaging and the yeah. <laughs> safety and the, the warranty on the tires because of the, of the law of reciprocity and the law of priming. And they can be used very gently together. Yeah. You know, as a Southern woman, we're not taught to negotiate the way that men are taught yeah. to negotiate. And and that's why really understanding a little bit about narcissism uh, will help us women because it's not the way that we normally negotiate. We yeah. are all about, you know, how can I make you feel good as yes. part of this negotiating process? Absolutely. But when you understand, if I make you feel good in the right way, even before we start negotiating and I 
put that law of reciprocity in and I prime you with my words and with my actions, then you're going to be more receptive to what I have to say right off the bat. And that's how you start the successful negotiations. I love that. And I find you've touched on so many things packed into there. And one is this difference about how we're taught to negotiate or not. And I don't think, Tracy, actually, it is just a Southern thing. I think women generally, I find, fall into one of two camps. They believe they're not effective negotiators because they assume negotiation has to be all about the bark and the bite. And so they step back and end up not getting what they want and deserve, or they tend to believe they have to bring that overcompensating sort of much more masculine energy to have their voice heard and be seen. So I love the idea. And it sounds like we're very much on the same page. I like this idea you priming, you know, in my programs, when I talk about it being that rapport building being such a key piece. So share some examples that you would use or suggest for priming when you're about to go into a negotiation. Well, you know, again, it's that's why negotiations are so much more powerful face to face than they are over the telephone. Yeah. So, of course, right now we're all learning to negotiate very differently than we ever have before. Yes. But even having the opportunity to do a negotiation via Zoom like this, you're going to be infinitely more successful because you can use so many of the nonverbals and because yes. you can find different things to compliment people on and different ways to interact. But a lot of the times people really don't even get to the heart of the negotiation until they've spent hours trying to figure out what the other person wants. Yeah. The more clarity that you can go into a negotiation with about what is your big win, the, the faster the whole process moves. But also learning to ask the right question of the person that you're negotiating with is going to save everybody time and money and energy. Mm -hmm. A lot of it really does come down to, you know, once you've built that rapport, once you've made sure that everybody involved in the transaction really does want a peaceful and an equitable resolution, asking the very simple question, what, what makes this a win for you? And then there's also something very powerful that we don't understand about taking notes during a negotiation. So, you know, Cindy, if I ask you what makes this a win for you and I actually take notes yeah. on what you're saying, then just that one act creates a level of rapport and makes you like me more. Yeah. And I wanted to, I want to break these down because I think these are all really valuable nuggets. So let's, let's break them down a little bit for the listeners out there who maybe don't have the experience in negotiation. So you talked about clarity, which I think is so important. And again, one of the things I know I spend a lot of time on with people like getting, you know, really getting that clarity yourself when you're going into a negotiation about what are the outcomes you want? You know, what is the possible range that you want? What is your deeper why, right? And considering with intention. So what would you have to say about creating? Because you, you mentioned that in this last answer as well about how important it is to have that clarity, right? About what's most important. Right. And to go into the negotiation with something in writing for what you feel is the most important thing. Yeah. There, there's something that we don't understand about putting pen to paper. So if I go into a negotiation and I have written down, these are my must have, and these are the things that are not terribly important, but I can use them kind of as leverage to get what I want the most. It changes the whole energy and the whole dynamics. Mm -hmm. She's person with the most clarity is going to win a negotiation because they know more about what they can pretend is important, but really isn't. Yeah. Yeah. So the best example, I, I have a, a friend who uh, is a, a divorce attorney. And one of the things that she talks about is, you know, if, if there's pets involved, if one spouse really loves the pet and the other spouse isn't as attached yeah. to the pet, then a way of manipulating the, the whole negotiation is to harp on something that's not necessarily terribly important to you. But mm -hmm. if you know what's important to the other person, it gives you a different level of leverage. The challenge is when you want to come from a negotiating standpoint where you're creating win-wins, how do you do that in the most enlightened fashion? And you do that simply by asking the right questions and finding out what's most important to the other person so that you can bump that up against what's most important to you and, yeah. and what are the things that you can get in on. Okay. And let's, again, I'd love to break that down a bit because again, you've touched on a bunch of things here. So I'd like to really explore that idea about how to create that win-win every time. Because I think there is a tendency. We've been, certainly we've been taught to believe that an effective negotiator is one who puts one over on the other side. And, you know, after 30 years of litigating as an attorney, 
you know, certainly that was the model that we grew up believing was the case. So you never left anything on the table, always went for that last dime, if you will. And it was not until many years later that I started to recognize like, geez, if, if I'm coming to a negotiation thinking I want this, you know, at this level, and you come to a negotiating thinking you want this, if we're not looking for putting one over on the other, we're actually to come up, able to come up typically with solutions that far surpass anything that either of us may have wanted, find true win-wins that go beyond the sort of split the baby. So I'd love your thoughts on that because I know mm-hmm. that win-win is important for you. I've heard you uh, speak to that. So what well, you hit the nail on the head. It's really the only way to, to first and foremost build your karma. But more <laughs> importantly, it's the, it's the easiest and quickest way to get the negotiation past the stalemates that that are always going to come about whenever you really have it as your intention to make sure that everybody involved gets as much of a win as humanly possible people feel that energy from you yeah and when they feel like you know what she's not trying to squeeze every last dime of course most of my negotiation has been in the real estate realm and whenever you really learn that you know people get hung up on ridiculous things i've seen deals fall apart over shelves somebody bought at that target you know <laughs> it's insanity right yeah. but but, and that and that was my first year in real estate, and and my client, I had the I had the sellers, and they had already packed up that shelf, and it was on a moving truck somewhere. They were like, it's just a shelf from Target; it wasn't permanently attached. But the buyers were so in love with that shelf. My client offered to to reduce the price, to send them a hundred bucks where they could get their own shelf. Nothing worked; they had to have that shelf. Wow. Well, it's when people become irrational in that way, if you're not looking for some win wins, you know, all it does is, is t- makes the whole process come to a screeching halt. I love that actually. Cause as you were saying that it was firing off things for me as well. One of the elements of my program, it's called no fear negotiating. So it's like no fear, but ego as well. And the third one, the A is attachment and the R reactivity, right? So being able to approach. So that target shelf is a perfect example of that becoming attached to something even when the value, and it works both ways. I've seen people become so attached to something, they end up walking away from a deal, even though it's in their best interest. Or alternatively, I see people get so attached to a result that they're still continuing to, the idea of that deal becomes so important that long past the point when it even makes sense for them anymore, they're still attached to that deal. So what's been your experience around that attachment piece? Well, and again, that's why understanding and having something in writing is so so terribly you know, when you, uh, when you break down what it is that you're most trying to accomplish and understand, are you looking for big rocks or are you looking for little rocks? If you focus on the big rocks, you can almost always bring that to, to a, a conclusion very early in the negotiating process with the smaller details. But again, it, it completely comes from that energy and asking the right questions. You know, why why is that so important to you? Help me understand what's the significance of it. Because lots of times people can talk themselves out of the stance that they're holding on to if yeah. you give them the freedom to do that and, and stay in curiosity, stay in that, you know, can you tell me a little bit more about that? What, what else could we do that might be an alternative? It's uh, The questions are always the answer in yeah. any negotiation that that you're doing and I, I i love the old adage about how if you know if you only have one solution well you're up a creek right <laughs> and but if you only have two possible outcomes that's really not much better there's always a third outcome yeah. so if, if you're in a negotiation and you can write down with you the person that you're negotiating with what are three possible outcomes and what are, what are the ramifications of those three then you're not just looking at well this is what i want and this is what you want you know, the whole thing about two people fight, but three people can get along better. Usually. Yeah. <laughs> so if you have three different possible outcomes that everybody agrees, yes, this might work, this might work, and this might work, then you're working toward a, a common solution. And it's not my way and your way. That third option has been a miracle drug in my negotiation over the past 20 plus years. I love that approach, actually. I always talk about sort of that flexibility piece, that if you come just really narrow-minded, focused on expecting only one outcome and their outcome, and it's an either-or, as opposed to being flexible to see other new outcomes and possibilities that arise as you chat and get higher up. I love that. And you touch on questions, which are another, and I was smiling while you're saying it because it's such a big part, a big belief system of mine as well, like the power 
of questions is so underestimated and not only underestimated, but I think people, we've been trained to believe in negotiations, the myth that the person who talks the loudest and the longest is the one who's going to win. When in fact, the opposite is true. The person who asks questions and listens and extracts information is the one who's going to really come ahead. So I'd love to hear a little more about your thoughts on the use of questions, because that's a big part of sort of what I teach as well. Absolutely. And, and I, I have found that this is one of the most transformational experiences of my entire life. When I learned to begin asking more questions instead of learning to state my case over and over again. So <laughs> You know, and again, I want to go back to the power of writing things down. Uh, another priming story that fits so beautifully into this is I used to wait tables, put myself through Baylor waiting tables, right? And like, oh, yeah, I think it's kind of a common thing, right? So in my psychology class, we were taught that, you know, normally waiters and waitresses are taught to compliment a, a customer's choice. Oh, you want the steak? Oh, our steaks are wonderful. You're going to love it. What a great choice. But actually, tips are bigger. When you order that steak, and I write down steak, medium rare, medium rare, baked potato, no sour cream. And then after you're done ordering, I look you in the eye and say, I just want to make sure I've got this order correct. And I read the order back to them. People feel heard and understand. Tips go up. So if I ask somebody that I'm negotiating with, tell me what's the most important thing in this particular case. What's most important is we try to find a closing date to close on this property. What's most important whenever you're looking to change brokerages and, and you're looking at the, the pros and cons, what's most important. When I write those things down and then I go back and I question you, you say it was very important to you that the training that your new real estate company was better than where you are previously. Can you tell me a little bit more about what makes a great trainer to you? What makes a great training class? First and foremost, I'm putting you back in the driver's seat yeah. for you to tell me what you need. Yeah. And when you tell me what you need, I can tell you how I can meet that need. Yeah. If I just hear, okay, you want better training. Well, everybody wants better training. Going back, following up on questions is going to get the person that you're working with more comfortable with you, feeling more loved, feeling more connected, feeling more heard, feeling like you empathize with them. Miracle drug. I and love it. Work themselves around to your way of thinking if they truly understand that you have their best interest at heart which is why the negotiation model that you teach is so much more effective than the negotiation model that most people teach, which is all about getting as much. Yeah. As yeah. Oh, I love this. I love your approach. And it's funny, you talk about natural, intuitive, like everything you're saying are the skill set of master negotiators. And it sounds like it's something that you just intuitively sort of developed yourself as a style, which is so beautiful. And the questions, you're always just sort of that step ahead as well, because asking those really calibrated questions to get somebody to come around. So instead of you convincing them of your position, you ask the calibrated questions. So they come around believing it's their solution as well, which is such a profound difference in their buy-in. And then you get longer lasting results with better relationships, right? So, so powerful. I love that. Now you've talked a lot about writing things down, Tracy. I'd love, like, I know you have a thing about the power of the pen as well. Is that what you mean when you reference the power of the pen in your work? Well, a hundred percent. So again, if you and I are talking and I'm taking notes, people will feel like you're paying more attention and then you can actually read back to them. So you're three or four hours into a negotiation. You can say, you know what, back when we were talking earlier, you said it was very important to you that the trainers that you're learning from are actively selling real estate. And because I'm referencing something that you actually said, you're more likely to feel like, oh yeah, that is what I said. So it, it goes back to a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. So <laughs> if I'm trying to convince you of something, even if you get tired and agree with me, you're going to want to renege on what you yes. agreed to, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. But if I use your words and if I reiterate, this is what you said, if you said it, it's true. Yeah. If I said it, you're going to doubt me. So what I'm trying to do is to really dig in deep about what do you want and how can I adjust my approach so that your needs are getting met. And again, that goes back to having more than one solution. Yeah. The other really powerful thing about the power of the pen is if I am taking notes and you're not, and I send a follow-up email with bullet points, yeah. guess what? 
you're getting it from my perspective, what I heard, what I heard you say. And uh, it's the whole thing about how two or three days later, we remember very little of what we heard. So if we can reference notes that I had taken, they're all being written from my perspective. It really makes a massive difference in negotiating. Yeah, huge, huge. I love that. And just for the listeners out there, our viewers as well, this applied, this theory, you know, that Tracy's laying out for us is so consistent with this concept of the art of feminine negotiation. It applies in every aspect of your life. So Tracy is a master, obviously, negotiator in real estate and beyond. This applies if you're a salesperson in other areas. For people out there who are coaches as well, like your, your sort of enrollment conversations are all around these same principles. Asking those calibrated questions, having the person see their own vision and mirroring their language back to them so they're buying in, they're enrolling themselves at that point We're using those calibrated questions. And I take it, what are your thoughts, Tracy, as well on, like with questions that we, you know, the different kinds of questions. I think so few people have ever really studied the use of questions or even give it any thought, like the difference between an open question versus a close, for example. You know, the value of posing a hypothetical question where it can be a great sort of stalemate buster when you say, you know, I'm just thinking out loud here, but what if we were to do this? That kind of hypothetical question doesn't commit you, but it allows you to test the temperature and start looking for those other options. I'd be interested in your thoughts on sort of the types of questions and how to use those strategically. Well, and and that's why it's so important whenever you go into negotiation to have those questions prepared. So yes, you do want them open-ended, but there are times when you may want to direct a conversation by the power of the question. So, you know, most of what I do now, of course, is recruit real estate agents all over the United States, Canada, Australia, and the UK. So Mm -hmm. most of my conversations now are about how can I help you as a real estate agent? If you make this change, make sure that it's a win for you. Make sure that you make more money, keep more money, have a better career. So understanding the power of those questions so that I can hear what is most important to you makes all the difference in any negotiation that you're doing, even in your personal life as well. So you have to be very comfortable with your outcome and really know where you want the outcome to be so that your questions are leading people in that right direction. You know, whenever you understand the concept of story branding, which of course is, is a very popular business trend right now. The whole idea of story branding is where, where do we want the story to go? And we, we want to make sure that our negotiations are stripped of every single conversation that's not taking us to the outcome yeah. that we're looking for, because you don't want things to become too convoluted. So yeah. when I ask very pointed questions, you know, what's the most important thing that would get this conversation where you feel like it's a win for you today? What's the most important thing to you today in reference to changing real estate brokerages? What's the most important thing to you today to make sure that you're taking that career to the next level? I'm curious, is the training the most important thing? See how I've immediately directed your attention to the training? That's what I want to talk about. And I love people, for all our listeners out there as well, catch the little subtleties in the language that are great, great tools for you as well that I'm curious powerful two little words, right? When you're asking quite, takes the sting off. It can allow you to go in directions and pose things as well. When you're saying like using words like I'm curious, or, you know, I invite you to think about, or language like that can really change the dynamic of a negotiation as well. And I love when you were saying, Tracy, too, about that difference when we said about opened and closed questions, because yeah, you want open question. It's knowing when to use them because you don't want your questions so open all the time that people are going off in directions. At some point, it's you know that targeting and also being able to get to a, a stage where you start using closed questions when you're needing to direct to get a yes, a yes, a yes to try and get them in that mindset shift as well. Super powerful. I love that. Mm-hmm. No, no, I was just going to say, and, and, and the phrases are, you know, I've, I've got my NLP certification and I would beseech anybody that's interested in having a better quality of life to invest in your NLP certification. But, you know, even statements like, well, you know, Cindy, everybody knows that can be very powerful whenever you're negotiating. Everybody knows the most important thing in choosing a real estate company is the power of the train. The most important thing whenever you're purchasing a home is to find a subdivision that you and your family are comfortable in. Don't you agree? 
So, and the nodding of the head, there's so many nonverbal yeah. things that you can do to get that agreement. Yeah. People want to be, and, and another statement that works very, very well, does it seem reasonable? Don't you think it seems reasonable that we go down this path because everybody wants to be perceived as everybody wants to be reasonable. And by the same token, there are trigger words that work the other way. So, I mean, I love, I think this is a beautiful conversation for that because people tend to, there are certain things that cause people to bristle where it, like, if you say, well, obviously, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you're, you're implicitly saying to somebody, you know, oh, you're so thick that you don't get it, which is not likely to engender the response you're looking for. So. And I'd love to hear you. I'm just thinking going back to the beginning, like our title when you talked about the narcissist, because I actually, I think that's something I would love to have you explore a little bit more because we do have, as women, tend to make ourselves smaller sometimes or overcompensate, but not being able to come from that place. We're such pleasers, right? So how do you find the narcissist piece works into your negotiation strategy? Well, I think it's something that we just need to be cognizant of. So that this the pop culture idea behind narcissism is a narcissist believes that everybody wants to serve them they they believe that you know for example in real estate a narcissist would believe well of course the seller wants me to have the house and they want me to get a good price on the house totally and completely alive from the pit of hell right all of us are concerned about ourselves we, we're all tuned into what's in it for me, correct? So if you can negotiate with the perspective of, you know what, the person that I'm talking with is, is narcissistic. All they care about is themselves. So if I can convince them that, hey, listen, I really do want to do what you want me to do. Help me make you happy. When you come from that perspective, yeah. they never see you coming. Yeah, that it, is beautifully powerful. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Make people understand that all that you want to do is make them happy. And if they feel that way and you're asking questions to get clarification on how do I make you happier, yeah. it's always going to go very well for you. That is such a powerful game changer. And again, I hope everybody really caught that as well, that subtle change as well. So not narcissism from coming to have your needs met, but being able to consider the other person as being narcissistic and how can you make them feel that you're putting their needs sort of first and foremost and wanting to meet them is a powerful aphrodisiac, frankly, for somebody to be able to get that rapport building. I love that. <laughs> it, it absolutely does. And it, it, it helps give genuine love for people. I can tell you that it makes it a whole lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. Which I, I'm sure for you is not about you just exude it, which is gorgeous. So I'm to say that like attracts like on, on that. Mind you, that's for sure. <laughs> well, thank you. And how would you use follow-up strategies? I know that's a big part of your success as well, Tracy, is having those follow-up strategies to be able to change the energy and rebuild those relationships. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So for example, in my, in my real estate world, I always wanted to be the one to write the contract. Okay. So even if I had the listing agent and the buyers brought a contract to me initially, as we went through the negotiation process, I wanted to be the one to write up the final paperwork mm -hmm. because that way I can make sure that what I believed the whole theory was and the, the meeting of the minds was I'm the one that's putting that on paper. Because people don't like to negotiate with stuff after it's already been put on paper. So that's a big part of it. You always want to be the one writing the follow-up email with all of the points. And that's why you want to be the one that's taking notes. So if I've got six or seven pages of notes for a three or four hour negotiation, and I put all of that in writing to 15 or 20 bullet points, those bullet points are going to be the ones that I feel most passionate about, correct? Yeah. And then I'm depending on the other person's memory. Oh, yeah, we did talk about that. Or didn't we discuss that? It, it, it you're, you're always going to have the biggest advantage if you are the one that's doing the follow-up email, you're the one that's writing the follow-up contract, you're the one that's putting the deal pen on paper. It makes a huge difference, even in your text messages. You know, Cindy, it was wonderful talking with you. Just wanted to confirm A, B, C, D, and E. Yeah. Did I, is there anything that I forgot? Is there anything, yeah. is there anything else that maybe we need to add to it? Well, then all that you're having to do is read it, but you're reading my take on the, the conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is beautiful. And, and I think sadly a dying art or one that people don't seem to do. And it's such a simple step to take and it serves multiple purposes as well. Even psychologically, re you're reinforcing for the other person your sort of vision or spin or take on how things played out and where we're going next steps, right? It's 
such as powerful tools. So again, a great little gold nugget falling from the ceiling for all our listeners out there, these really simple tools and strategies that you can use to up-level your negotiations, right? And how important do you think it is? I know one of the elements that I talk about are, I call them the five W's, the five secret weapons, like that who, what, where, when, and why. And really applying with intention, like who should be at the table? There are certain negotiations where you don't want somebody to be sitting down or to be the spokesperson, right? Who do you want to show up as? Who is the other person likely showing up as in those conversations? But also that when, like really choosing your when strategically and the where. Is that something you found in real estate applies as well, would you say, Tracy, or... You know, there's a there's a fascinating story. Uh, it's the I, Philippine prison story. If you uh, if you Google that, that should pull it up. Where they they took a look at Philippine prisoners that were parole that were up for parole, and the prisoners that their parole hearings were in the morning were very likely to get parole. Wow! If they're Hearings were right after lunch. They were very likely to get parole. They almost always parole was denied. The go-to reaction is no. I get up in the morning and I put something in the crock pot. I've got a lot of energy at six, yeah. seven in the morning. But if dinner's not ready to go at six o'clock in the evening, there's no way I'm opening up the refrigerator. Yeah, beautiful. You want to do the negotiations after you've had a spectacular come in a peaceful place. So yeah. it, it is that you want to be negotiating early in the morning or early in the afternoon. Never have a negotiation after a couple of cocktails or <laughs> late in the day when you're in jail. <laughs> That's funny you say that. That's one thing I talk about as well in terms of the where or when. Like there are some conversations that you may want to have sort of, uh, you know, off work on site, but there are other conversations that you never want to have take place during, you know, when you've got a few cocktails. So that's beautiful. Well, this has been fabulous. And let me sort of close off by asking you, what would you say is one of the greatest mindset shifts that you've ever had in your life, Tracy? It can be around the negotiation piece or, or not, whatever. I, I open it up for you. Well, that's easy. We become what we think about. So, yeah, it, it, it's the only thing that every great spiritual leader seems to agree on, correct? And every great thought leader. Yeah. So if you want to have focus on how you want it to go, if you want to have a beautiful relationship, if you want to have a beautiful meal, yeah. if you want to set a beautiful place, think about what the outcome is. Is how you want it to go, and then not your direction. Beautiful. I love that. So powerful. So I thank you so much. This has been a wealth of information. For those of you out there who want to learn more about Tracy Lewis, maybe follow up, especially if you're in real estate, I would highly recommend that you go out of your way to look her up so you can learn. Yes, yeah, my pleasure. At www.explodeyourcareer.com. And also check out her social media links at facebook.com slash Tracy, and it's G-E-R-O, or check facebook.com. We've got Tracy L E W I S for Lewis coaching or explode your real estate career as well as another Facebook page where you can check her out or at Instagram as well. Just Tracy Lewis dot realtor. And we'll make sure to post all of those uh, links in the show notes so you can make sure to follow up with Tracy. So I'm sure you all got loads of value from this episode. And if so, subscribe if you haven't already done so. And make sure to share with anyone that you think could get some value from this message. And let's face it, as I often say, all of life is a negotiation. So these have been some incredibly valuable nuggets about how to bet negotiate your best life by using these simple tools and strategies and awareness, just lifting up your awareness about these. So who couldn't approach from benefit from that approach to life? And also make sure to join our Women on Purpose community as well if you haven't yet at facebook.com slash groups slash women on purpose community. And that's a wrap for this episode. Until next time, go forth and negotiate your best life on your terms so you can stop missing out and start getting more of what you want and deserve from the boardroom to the bedroom. You've been listening to The Art of Feminine Negotiation from the boardroom to the bedroom with your host, Cindy Watson. Thanks for tuning in and be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss a single episode. And while you're at it, please leave a rating and review and be sure to share it with your friends. Tune in every Monday for more exciting insights and wisdom on how to get more of what you want and deserve from the boardroom to the bedroom. 
And until next time, stop missing out. Negotiate your best life on purpose and with purpose. 